Hello, and welcome to our Surge Experience Online. It is a joy to have you join us today and an honor to share our ministry with you. We pray you will be blessed by the worship, the message, and the ministry. If you are new to Surge, we want to welcome you. Please log on to our website at surgechurch.tv and complete the online connect card that you will find on the main graphic of the homepage. It will be a privilege to connect with you and to be a part of your spiritual growth. As we gather together today, let's join in worship, receive God's word in faith, and stay connected in spirit. Get ready because the Surge Experience starts now. Well, praise God. How many people are excited to be in the house of God this morning? I'm so excited and I just can't hide it. Why? Because God's good and he's on his throne. And you know what? I'm not fighting this life and this, the battles that we face alone. We're, we're fighting with the greatest warrior of all time. He's the heavyweight champion of the universe and he's never lost one. Come on, amen. His name is Jesus. Praise God. Hey, are you ready for the word of God this morning? Hebrews chapter 10, verse 38 and 39. And today I'm talking about a faith checklist, right? You've got to have a checklist. If you're going to, if you're going to, if you're going to, if you're going to travel somewhere, I know like we were packing for, uh, take Sydney with us. I mean, come on, everything he says he wants to take with, you got to have a checklist, right? And uh, whatever it is in life, you know, I'm a to-do list kind of person. So I like, I like to just every day I update my to-do list for the, for the week because I'm always checking things off. But you know what? When it, term, when it comes in, uh, to terms of growing in God and walking and living by faith, we need to make sure we have our faith checklist to make sure our faith is in check and that it is, is growing in the Lord. And so Hebrews chapter 10, verse 38 and 39, I love this passage. It's so powerful. It says, now my righteous one will live by faith. And I take no pleasure in the one who shrinks back. Notice that. God doesn't, he doesn't take pleasure when you shrink back in fear. Mary was preaching last week about the fact that faith is greater than fear. Well, today we're talking about, hey, if we're going to grow in our faith, we're going to create some checklists today that's going to help us to be able to be better receivers of what God has for us so that we can receive it by faith. And we've got to know, first of all, that the just, they live by their faith, I mean, come on, you couldn't go to Noah's Ark and not just be blown away by the faith of Noah, his wife, and his three sons. But you know what? It's time for you to have great faith for what God's called you and I to build together. You live by faith. He takes pleasure in it, but he doesn't take pleasure in the one who shrinks back. But we do not belong to those who shrink back. Come on, church. Don't forget who you are. We don't belong to those who shrink back. And are destroyed, but to those who have faith and are saved. You know what? As God's people, we're called to walk and to live by faith and not by sight. Not by, not by the things we see, but by the things that we know is true in God's word. Our life and belief is not based on the things that we see or don't see in the natural, but rather based on the reality of God's word. The truth is, if we're not moving forward in faith, we're not moving forward at all. And the word of God is clear that we, uh, that God is pleased with those who are, are moving forward in faith, but he's displeased when we shrink back in faith. And the, those who shrink back in a lack of faith, they, they're shrinking back to destruction. Come on. Why do you need to live by faith? It's because there's victory in faith. There's breakthrough in faith. There's healing in faith. There's overcoming power in faith. But when you shrink back, you're shrinking back to the destruction that God has not ordained for you. So Paul, uh, the, script, the writer of Hebrews, which I personally believe is Paul, he said that, hey, you don't, you don't draw back in, in, in fear to destruction. You move forward in faith because God's pleased by that. And today I want to encourage you in 2021, it doesn't matter what happened in that previous year. What matters is you're moving forward right now by faith, and as you do, you're going to move forward right into your blessing, right into your breakthrough. God has called us to surge forward. If I can use a word like surge, God calls us to surge forward in faith to be who he's called us to be. Now, I want to talk today about our, your checklist, and specifically, as Mary was talking last week about faith is greater than fear, when we shrink back in fear, fear brings on the destruction. But when we rise up and move forward in faith, faith brings the, break, the breakthrough and the blessing. So to help you grow your faith, today I want to talk to you about receiving by faith and just give you some practical checkpoints that you can uh, uh, make note of. And you can uh, write this down in your notes today. Be sure you remember these things. Also, you can take notes in our Surge Church app, just saying. 
And then email them to yourself later. But I want to talk to you about receiving by faith. If we're going to do the things God's called us to do and, and uh, have the things that he's provided for us, then we've got to learn how to receive by faith. Somebody say receive by faith. You're not going to receive anything from God apart from faith. All right? You're not going to receive from God because you want it. You're going to receive from God because you receive it by faith. You know, the word, the word uh, uh, we, we know that faith is the currency of the spirit realm. So we've got to use our faith in God to receive in the natural what has been made available to us in the spirit. Amen? So the faith is the currency of heaven. If faith is the currency of the spirit realm, faith is not the currency of the natural realm. The natural realm is, is dominated by the senses, what you can sense, see, taste, smell, feel, touch, experience. People say, I don't, I'll believe it when I see it. Remember Thomas in the upper room when they told him that Jesus has been raised from the dead? Well, Thomas wasn't present when Jesus walked through the wall, right? And, and so he didn't believe it at first. You know, we always give Thomas the bad rap about being doubting Thomas. But you know what? In that moment, you probably would have doubted too because you thought these people are crazy. Because it's amazing how often we're dominated by our sense knowledge, right? Sense realm knowledge, right? What we experience and know and see. And so they said, Thomas, we're telling you the truth. And all, uh, he said, I'm not going to believe it until I see the nail prints in his hand, until I see the wound in his side. And lo and behold, Jesus in his glorified body walked back through the wall again. He's like, Burp. And Thomas was like, oh, Jesus, I was playing, man. Come on. Jesus is like, Thomas, touch the wound in my hand. Thomas, touch the wound in my side. You believe it now? Do you know what Jesus said? Blessed are those who believe and don't see. Blessed are those who believe and they don't see. Right? So we've got to learn how to receive it by faith. We must use our faith in God to receive in the natural what's been made available to us in the spirit. Second Chronicles 16, 9, it says this. I love this verse. For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong on behalf of those whose heart is loyal. God doesn't bless everyone. He bless people whose hearts are loyal. Right? That's the difference between a Cain and an Abel, one who has the heart and one who doesn't. Right? This isn't something because somebody claims something or wears the Christian t-shirt or has a religious spirit. It's the heart that God is always judging. David's seven brothers looked awesome. They looked like uh, candidates to be the next king. But God said, I've rejected all seven. I'm looking for the one who's got the heart. And you know what? It, it kind of, you, you know you live in the South when you relate everything to, to football. Right? Because we play football. So I'm going to relate this to football. You can take a great quarterback, Right? It's like a great quarterback. I mean, the quarterback is the guy on the offense. He's the team, man. He's the, he's the face of the team. He's the leader of the, off, of the offense, especially. And so, you know, quarterback's a tough job because he's got to read the defense, know the plays. He's got to know where everybody's got to be. He's got to react in just milliseconds, and he's got to deliver the ball, and it's got to be on point. But you know what? You can have a great quarterback, know all the plays, know where everyone has to be. He has a phenomenal arm. He's accurate, and, uh, and, and, and the play is, is the right call for the right moment. But you know what? If the receiver doesn't get to where the ball's got to be and have his hands out to receive what the quarterback is giving and passing and delivering, then it doesn't matter how great the quarterback is, doesn't matter how awesome he throws, if the receiver's not in position to receive the ball. Come on. And you know what? God is the great quarterback in heaven and his eyes. You know, a quarterback has to be scanning the eye. His eyes have to be scanning the field. He's got to be looking who's open and he's got to throw it in the spot where he knows the receiver is supposed to run. Come on. And the eyes of the the Lord. He's that great quarterback in the sky. He is looking to pour out a blessing. He's looking to deliver the package. Come on, somebody. But you and I have to be in the position to receive what he wants to give us. Amen. Well, I didn't receive it, but you're not operating in the faith that God's called you to. He's wanting to give you the past, but your hands have got to be up and you've got to receive it and praise God. So we know that we position ourselves to receive by faith when we believe and we trust in God. And we, you know, there's, you know, God has made us to be workers and doers and what and achievers, but there's just some things that you're never gonna work enough to accomplish. 
You'll never work enough overtime to accomplish. Come on, somebody. There's just some things you'll never do apart from God's ability in your life. And that's what hangs up a lot of people that, with their inability to live by faith. Because there's just, you have to just, sometimes you just got to receive what God has already made available to you. Amen? Because I can do my part, but after that, God has to do his part. But he does his part when he finds that faith receiver. His eyes are scanning. The Bible says the seven eyes of God look through the earth. I mean, that's one weird-looking dude. Sorry, Lord. I mean, <laughs> I mean, a quarterback's got two eyes, but the Bible's the seven eyes of God, just meaning that God is scanning in all directions. And he's looking for somebody who's got the heart of faith to have their hands up to receive what he wants to bring to their lives. You know, God wants to bless you. He's not looking to strike you. God ain't mad at you. He's mad about you. You've got to have your hands up, and you've got to be in position to receive what he wants to deliver to you. The Bible tells us that faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. That means that faith grasps the unrealities of hope and brings them into the reality of, uh, of, your, of your life. Yeah, I love the fact that it says in Hebrews 11.1, 1, it says, now faith is. Come on, I love that. That's so awesome. Now faith. Faith isn't tomorrow. Faith isn't next week. Well, I'm going to get myself together and get my faith up. No, faith is right now. It's right now. What is it laying hold of? It's, it's reaching out into the unseen realm and laying hold of what you're hoping for and receiving it right now. I receive my healing right now. I receive that promotion right now. I'm receiving my breakthrough and deliver right now. Lord, next week would be fine with me. I'll pencil it in. Come on, God's giving it right now. Right now. now faith is. And if I ever heard my dad, there's so many things I've heard my dad say over the years just to ring in my ear, but I heard him say a thousand times, if you're not in hope, then you're not in faith. Why? Because faith lays hold of what you're hoping for. And it, come on, if you have your hope out there, then it's something for your faith to grab and receive it right now. Come on, somebody. You ought to be more excited than that. It grasps the unrealities of hopes, and it brings it into reality. It's not hocus pocus. This isn't Christian voodoo. It's how faith works. It just receives right now what God has already done in Jesus. Look at James 1, 5 through 7. If anyone lacks wisdom, let him ask of God who gives to all liberally and without reproach, and it will be given to him. But let him ask in faith with no doubting, for he who doubts is like a wave of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. For let not that man suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. Notice that. In this passage, James is speaking about wisdom. He starts with wisdom. He said, if you lack, if anyone, right, anyone lacks wisdom, I know some people, if anyone lacks, there's some days I lack it, right? If anyone lacks wisdom, the Lord said, hey, ask, James says, hey, ask God. If you ask him, he's going to give it to you, not just a little bit of wisdom. He said he'll give it to you abundantly and liberally. He'll pour out wisdom because the spirit of God is the spirit of wisdom. He'll give it to you. But there's one condition, he said, you got to ask in faith without wavering. Asking in faith means that one believes that he has what he asked for without wavering, and he's going to receive it, right? Well, I asked God for wisdom, but I'm not sure he's given it. <laughs> Come on. God's going to give me wisdom in this situation. God, I'm thanking you for the wisdom right now, and he's going to pour it out to you. Liberty. You know, I'm not going to waver on it. Will, will he give me the wisdom? Yeah, he gave me the wisdom yesterday. Uh, today, I'm not so sure I got the wisdom. Come on, that's being double-minded. I got it. No, no, I don't have it. You're, then guess what? You don't have it. When you have it, you know, I ask God for wisdom. He has poured it out on my life, and today I'm walking in the wisdom of God that I need for this situation. I receive it by faith, right? And so asking in faith means that one believes that he has what he asked for without wavering, and he's going to receive it. And I love this. James started by talking about wisdom, but he ends that passage by saying uh, uh, all things. He said, notice that the man who doubts will not receive anything from God, whether it's wisdom or anything else. If he's doubting in his heart and he's wavering, there's, he's not going to receive anything from God. The point that James was making was to emphasize the receiving by faith, right? Whether one is asking for wisdom or for any other thing in this life, you're not going to receive it from God 
if, you're un, if you are wavering. But if you have that unwavering faith to say, Lord, I receive it, then guess what? You're going to get it. Amen? Why? Because he's that quarterback. His eyes are looking. And when he sees that faith, the receiver, he hits you. You know, he's not one of those quarterbacks where the receiver, who's an acrobat, who has to make an amazing play to make the quarterback look good. Right? Like, like Devontae Smith is your for Alabama. He's going to make any quarterback look good. Right, he's an acrobat, <laughs> right? You know, quarterbacks would be like, could you go to whatever NFL team I'm going to go to, right? But you know what? God, when he, he delivers the ball, he puts it around the spot in stride. You don't have to turn around, jump, stop what you're doing. You know what? He makes you look good. Right? So you're not going to receive anything from God apart from faith. Now, there are people, say, those faith people. When they do that, I'm like, yes, sir, thank you. Thank you. Those name it and claim it, blab it and grab it people, that's right. You talking about me again? It isn't name it and claim it and blab it and grab it. It's, hey, you believe in your heart and you confess with your mouth. It's just how faith works. It's how faith works, right? I'm not going to waver and I'm not going to let what my natural circumstances tell me what God has already done for me. The Bible says he did it for me, then I'm going to put my faith on it, and I'm going to ask him for it, believing that I receive it, and I know I'm going to have it. There's three people excited about that. Two golf claps and a stomach growl. I mean, come on. That's how faith works. You know, so don't let other people who have a religious spirit deter your faith. Jesus cursed the fig tree. And the disciples were like, what in the world is he doing now? But guess what? Those roots died immediately. The next day, they're like, oh, my God, it's dead. He said, I told you, people, have faith in God. And when you see the mountain in your way, you quit talking about the mountain and quit <laughs> crying about the mountain. He said, you speak to that mountain. Come on. Quit talking about the mountain or it's going to start talking back to you and tell you to be quiet. You got to speak to that mountain. I speak to that mountain of disease. I speak to that mountain of lack. I speak to that mountain. Come on. That mountain standing in the way of my children. You got more than four kids. You're cheering. I mean, come on. <laughs> right? Whatever it is, we're standing in, we're, you know, it's standing in our way, but we have faith in God. We believe it and we receive it. Faith positions us in the earth to receive what God desires to give us from heaven. Real quickly, I'm going to give you the three checklists to be a faith receiver. Number one, you've got to believe in your heart. You've got to believe in your heart. Romans 10, 8 through 10 says, but what does it say? The word is near you. Where is it? It's in your mouth. And it's in your, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks, Right? That is the word of faith which we preach. That if you confess your, with, with your mouth the Lord Jesus and you believe in your heart that God's raised him from the dead, then you're going to be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness and with the mouth confession is made to salvation. So if we're going to position ourselves to receive by faith, we must understand that believing takes place in our heart and not in our head. Yeah, I believe that. No, no, you, you, you can't. Faith isn't believing that God's word is a fact in your mind. You can't just agree with something. That's not faith. A lot of Christians think they're living by faith because they agree with the truth or they agree with a fact. But that doesn't mean you're walking by faith. Faith is like, I know it's true in my spirit. I know it's true. Because your head will trick you on Monday. You're sitting in church. We've been worshiping together. And we love each other. And the word of God is being preached. Come on. And you're, you're feeling encouraged. But Monday is coming. Here's a news flash. Sunday afternoon is coming. On the way home with your family is coming. I don't want to depress anybody right now. Be encouraged in Jesus' name. But it's not what your circumstances say. If all you do is agree with a fact out of the Bible, you, the, the, the circumstances are going to challenge that immediately, and you'll start wavering. But when you know something in your heart and spirit that it's the truth, and that you come on, then you start walking in faith. Amen. Everything God has for you must be received by faith. And so if we're going to position ourselves to receive by faith, we've got to understand that believing doesn't take, it's not in your head, it's, it's in your heart. 
You know, Paul explained the salvation. How does, when you were born again, how did it happen? You believed in your heart, the Lord Jesus, and you what? You confessed with your mouth. And you were born again. Well, the same is true that everything you're going to receive, if you're going to receive your healing, you've got to believe in your mouth and you've got to confess it. You got to, excuse me, believe in your heart and confess it out of your mouth. Amen. Praise God. It's not denying reality. I'm not sick. I am not sick. Yeah, you are. And you're looking sick. I am not sick. I don't receive that. It's not about that. It's like, you know what? I'm sick. But Jesus said, I'm healed, and in spite of what I'm going through right now, I'm going to believe and trust his word that I'm going to be healed from this. Come on, somebody. Amen? So we believe, we, we believe in our heart, the Lord Jesus, and we confess with our mouth. That's how we're born again, and that's how you, you receive everything from God. Paul underscored, belief begins in one's heart. This is true for receiving salvation and every other thing. Notice Matthew 21, 22. Jesus said, and whatever things you ask in prayer, believing you'll receive them. Notice that. Whatever things. Somebody say things. That means that anything you're going to get from God, you're, you're, going to, you're only going to get it one way, by faith. God's no respecter of persons, but he's a respecter of faith. Right? Anybody who comes to him in faith will get what they're asking for. Come on, amen? When it's in accordance with his, what he promises in his word. Mark 9, 23, Jesus said to him, if you can believe, all things are possible to him who believes. What does that mean? Everything you're going to receive in, from the Lord, it has to be received by faith. So what's our first checklist? Believe in your heart. Mark 11, 23 and 24, it's the same passage about him when he cursed the fig tree. He used it as a lesson of faith to the disciples. For surely I say to you, he said, that whoever says to this mountain, be removed and be cast in the sea, and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that those things he says will be done, he will have whatever he says. Therefore I say to you, whatever things, notice that, whatever things, plural, you ask when you pray, believe that you receive them and you're going to have them, right? So whatever it is, all the things that God has for you, they're only going to be uh, manifested and received by faith. So notice he says, you gotta, we're talking about believing in your heart. Now, the heart is the life center of man, both physically and spiritually. In a physical sense, it's the pumping station, right? It's the thing that causes the blood to flow in your body. It is your, physically, it's that pumping station. But you know what? The, your, when the Bible speaks of your heart, it's talking about your, your spirit, your inner man, the, the human spirit that the Lord has regenerated when you were born again. It's your spiritual pumping station, right? That's why you've got to feed yourself on the word of God Come on, somebody. That's why when you see somebody who's born again, but they don't, they don't, or they're not, they don't allow themselves to be disciple. What happens? They'll, 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 they're still living like they used to live because their spirit was born again, but their mind was never renewed. Why? Because faith isn't born in your mind; it's born in your, it's born in your spirit. It's born in your heart. Man cannot know God by sense knowledge. He can't know God by sense knowledge. God is only revealed to man through His Spirit. This is why the Bible says that the spirit of man is the candle of the Lord. God ignites your spirit. He doesn't ignite your mind. He ignites your spirit. And we must remember that man is a spirit. He has a soul and he has a body, but you are a spirit. Are you guys getting me? You are a spirit. You have a body and you have a soul, but what you are is you're, you're not just your body. You are a spirit. This means that the soul contacts the intellectual realm. The body contacts the physical realm, but the spirit contacts the spirit realm. I'm going to say it again so you can say amen. Write this down. This is a great on your check. The, 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 the soul contacts the intellectual realm. The body contacts the physical realm around it. You know what? We, the, the day we visited the ark, it was cold. And my physical body contacted the cold and said, you know what? Let's stay inside. I can see the ark from a distance. Right? <laughs> Why? Because I was like, man, I sure hope to God Noah put a heater in that ark. Why? Because my physical body contacted the outside realm and said, it's cold, Jack. That's why I was like, let's go back to Mobile where it's T-shirt Sunday in February. But it's your spirit that contacts the spirit realm. And that is what God latches hold of. Our spirit acquires faith. Come on, this is good teaching. I'm going to go quick so we can close. But please listen to this. Your spirit acquires the faith and our intellect obtains it through the word of God. I'm going to say it again so you can say amen. Our spirit acquires the faith 
And our intellect obtains it through the word of God. You cannot grasp faith through your mind so that it trickles down eventually into your spirit. Faith is birthed in your spirit when you believe in your heart and the word of God then causes one's mental faculties to lay hold of it. It's got to be born inside you, right? You know, isn't the, and people in the world have it backwards. They say, trust your heart, whatever your heart tells you to do. That's not what God said. God said, Jack, man, you're making a mistake. I just feel in my heart, well, man, you already made the mistake, okay? So you're already starting from the mistake position, just feel in my heart. Well, no, faith isn't a feeling. Faith is a, is a reality of what God's promised. God said, don't trust your heart. So when he's talking about believing your heart, he's not talking about that heart. He's talking about the spirit of the man, all right? The spirit that God has regenerated, that's where God puts the faith. Come on. That's why the word of God is so important so that it can, our, our mental faculties can lay hold of was already been born in our spirit. Man, come on, somebody. That's good right there. You need to, that's good teaching. So people of faith have acquired faith in their, in their spirit, right? So when it says the just will live by faith and not by sight, why is that? Because people of faith have already acquired faith in their spirit. Come on, faith people. So when we're not living by faith and we're moved by everything we see, guess what? We are not developing the faith that's been acquired in our spirit. People of faith, we don't, we're not consulting. You know what they say on the news, man, you're not getting news anyway, Jack. I don't know. I don't know how many people in America can't figure it out. You're not getting news. You're just getting views. Don't consult the outside world. Don't consult social media to find out what's happening. What God has said is what's going to build your faith. We don't consult the physical evidence for, for, for facts. To believe with all of our heart is to believe independently of our sense knowledge. How are you going to believe with all your heart? I'm going to act like I didn't just hear that. I'm going to act like I didn't just see that. I am going to believe in my heart independently of what my circumstances are telling me it is because God's word is a greater truth than the reality that I'm... So our faith... Our faith is rooted in the, relation, the revelation of who Jesus is and the reality of his word. And that trumps, that supersedes our, our normal circumstances. And this is what positions us to receive. So that's what it means to believe in your heart. You guys with me? Amen. And please welcome my man, my dude, Mr. Tyler McCowan, as he comes to receive our offering today. Wasn't worship good? I really like that last song, you know. Uh, another good thing to build our foundation on is giving. I mean, am I wrong? I like the, I like the bridge in it, you know. Um, I will trust in you alone and I won't be shaken. We should trust the Lord with our, with our money. And we shouldn't be shaken by it. We shouldn't be afraid to give it up. I just want to share a quick verse with you too. 2 Corinthians 9, 7. Each one must give as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for the Lord loves a cheerful giver. That's just really good to hear that he loves a cheerful giver. It makes me kind of want to give. I'm like, man, he likes it. You know, we shouldn't, our giving shouldn't be a burden. And we shouldn't be like, I got to pay my 10% today. No, <laughs> I wanted to buy the new iPhone. I don't want to give my money, you know. And you know, if that's how you're going to give, you know, just keep your check. Pastor Brad probably didn't want to hear it. He's like, yeah, we'll take it. <laughs> but I mean, being real, if you're just going to give like that, you should keep it. You know, you need, to, you need to change your heart. When you give, you should be like, I'm going to give this money, and I want someone to be blessed by it. And I want this money that I know it's going to bring people to the kingdom and expand it. We, we serve a giving God, so shouldn't we be a giving people? I mean, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son, you know? The least we can do is give 10%. I mean, come on, that's not that bad. Um, and I mean, this isn't only concerning money, you know? You can give money, you can give your time, your effort to people. It's not just about, here's my money, I hope it does something good, you know? We need to, our life needs to be giving. We, we serve Jesus whose whole life and ministry was nothing but serving and giving. And if we're to reflect him, that's, that's what we got to do. I mean, to be completely honest, giving isn't an option in a Christian life. It's, it's, a, it's necessity. It's not an option. 
So if we're, it's an option, if it's a necessity, we need to do so with excitement. You know, I don't want to say like, if you give 10%, if you give to the poor, if you help people, you know, when you give your 10%, when you give to the poor, when you help people, when you serve, let's do it with excitement. You know, and I just, that's all I really have for you. And, you know, I just want to pray real quick before we end this off and go into the message. I just want to pray with me. Dear Lord, I pray that you just change our hearts, God, and help us be cheerful givers and to just give with excitement, love, and joy, that we know that what we give will be used to expand your kingdom and will just bless people's lives. Because we know it's better to store up treasures in heaven than to store down here, God. Help us to not be greedy with what we have, Lord, but to just be giving. And I just thank you, Lord. And there, amen. And there's many ways to give on the slides. You can give by uh, your app. You can give cash and check down here. Give online, text to give. The second checklist is to act on the word of God. Act on it. Act on it. True faith acts on the word. True faith acts on the word. Amen? Don't tell me you got faith because you said amen on Sunday, but you live on Monday and you're not acting like you still believe what you said. Amen? Amen? It acts on the word. Scripture teaches us that, that, that we're to be doers of the word, not just hearers only. Those who do the word, the Bible, James said, are going to be blessed in all they do. But those who don't hear the word, what do they do? They, I mean, those who hear it, but they don't do what they hear, they cancel the blessing, right? They cancel the blessing. So uh, we don't want to do that. Faith, we know that faith without works is dead. Faith isn't just seeing I agree with something, I believe in something. When you believe it down in your spirit, and that it's starting to alter your mental faculties to now your mind is now being trained by faith that you know what, I'm not consulting the physical evidence to believe, I'm believing in my heart and I know that God's word is true, not what my circumstances say is true, that will empower you to start acting on the word of God. And when you start acting on the word of God, other people who are even religious, they're gonna think you're crazy, why? Because that's not what circumstances say, that's not what your situation says, but that's what my God said and I'm going to go with what my God said, and I'm going to receive right now in my natural circumstances what he's already made available to me. It isn't crazy. It's how faith works. It's not how religion works. It's how faith works. Who was always against Jesus? The religious spirits. Come on, right? Act, live. So we got to be active and living in our faith and, and, and belief in God's word, and that comes by acting on it. Active faith is acting on the word of God. Remember the paralytic man in Mark chapter 2, 1 through 12? They couldn't get, G- they couldn't get the man, his four crazy friends. You know, you need to be careful who your friends are. That's why we always warn people about your family, man. Because that's Pookie and them. And that's Uncle Ray Ray, right? And he might be your cousin, he might be your uncle, and they might be your blood, but they don't mean they're your, of your spirit. Right? Well, and so you don't let them talk you out of your faith, right? It'd be better to have four crazy friends that will tear our roof off to get you into the presence of Jesus than to talk, well, we just can't, you can't get your miracle today. They're like, Jack, you getting a miracle because we tired of carrying you around everywhere you go. You getting a healing today. It's the last day we care. But you know what? They couldn't get in the house where Jesus was teaching, so they said, fine. They climbed up on the top of the house, tore a hole in the roof, and lowered the man down into. And Jesus said, hey, your sins are forgiven. Now, rise up and walk. And by the way, we don't have enough room in here, dude. Take your bed with you. If that man had just laid there and not acted on what Jesus said, all of the tearing of the roof off and Lord would have been in vain. Because people can't believe for you. At some point, you've got to stand in the presence of your God in faith and believe for yourself. Woo! Thank you, Pastor Brad. Yes, ma'am. You are welcome. You gotta believe for yourself. He said, get up. And so the man, here's a paralyzed man. What do you mean, get up? Jesus said, get up. He started getting up, and lo and behold, the power of God hit him. And he got up, and he walked away, and he carried his bed, right? Remember Peter and the multitude of fish in Luke 5? He slept, you know, he was sleepy that day. They worked all night, caught nothing. It's amazing when you have the right people in your boat. 
Because you fish at night, right? You rest and prepare in, during the daytime for the next night. But Jesus wanted to borrow Peter's boat for a floating pulpit because a crowd was gathering around the shore. And so Jesus preached, and it was hot, and Peter was dozing off because the water was, you know, the waves. And Jesus said, hey, after he got finished preaching, you guys think I preach long, please. Jesus was like, and for my 45th point, <laughs> right? <laughs> he said, Peter, we're finished. He's like, huh, what? He said, launch out into the deep for a great catch. Now, his mind said, that's not how it works, Jesus. You're a carpenter. I'm a fisherman. He said, yeah, but you didn't catch anything last night, Jack, and you're behind on your bills. So physically, his flesh didn't want to because he was sleepy. Intellectually, he said, it's the reverse. Fish aren't out in the middle of the day, dude. They're out at night and in the morning. So I'm getting ready to, I, I gotta, that's why I got to hurt. You got to hurt him close this message out so I can get some sleep to go back out tonight and hopefully catch two or three fish. And Jesus said, I, I'm about to bless you. You just need to do it. But notice he said, but nevertheless, it, it, it went against his flesh. It went against his intellect. But there was something in his spirit said, Jack, you need to do this. So he said, Lord, I, I, nevertheless, at your word, I'm going to launch out. And man, you all know the rest of the story. Why? Because faith starts in your heart, but you've got to act on it. You've got to act on it. Amen? Praise God. So it's not mental uh, assent. That does it. It's faith. Mental assent, you, will, you can agree and believe the word's true, but true faith believes in the heart and confesses with the mouth. It's mine. I already have it. We don't look like it. I wasn't talking to you. Amen? I'm healed. Well, you sure aren't walking like it. Stop it. I'm healed. Why? Why? Because faith, you have to act on it. You start acting like it's already yours. Why? Because it already is. It already is. Jesus already made it available. You know, the Bible says that God watches over his word to perform it, but he must believe it. But we've got to believe it enough to act on the word to receive what God desires to perform in our lives. Amen. Receiving is not struggling to get it. Praying for it, crying for it, and rolling around. That doesn't make God give it to you. Receiving is simply acting on God's, what God has already spoken. Faith is a noun but believing is a verb, right? Faith is a noun, but believing is the verb. What's our second checklist? Act on the word. First one is believe in your heart. It's not a mental thing. It's, a spirit. it's in your spirit, right? But the second thing is act on it, right? Because believing is an action. Faith is the noun, is the idea. But acting on it, when you're walking by faith, that's the action of it. Praise God. Notice, uh, notice Ephesians 1.3, Paul said, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who's blessed us with every spiritual blessing in, air, in heavenly places in Christ. Notice that Paul was not teaching Christians to believe. He wasn't saying, believe. Come on, guys, believe it. That's not what he's saying. He taught that the blessing of God was already theirs. He said, you've already been blessed with every spiritual blessing. So what's he encouraging them to do? To walk in the things that's already been provided for them by Jesus. To have to encourage believers to believe as a result of the word having lost its reality in our hearts. Well, that's tight, but right. If we're, if, we're, if we're faith people and we believe in God and we've already been born again and the spirit of God is in our hearts and lives and we're, and we're in the word of God, then, then, there's no, then we're going to have faith and we're going to believe. But if we're having to be constantly encouraged to believe, that means the reality of God's word has lost its impact. Paul's not saying, guys, believe. He's saying, hey, go ahead and walk in and receive what you already believed and it's already been made available for you through Jesus. And the third checklist, and I'm closing with this, is know what belongs to you. you got to first check, believe in your heart. Not in your mind, but in your heart. Because your mind will, all, will play tricks on you. Your emotions will play tricks on you, but your spirit man, will, when you let your spirit man rule, it's gonna, it's gonna, the faith is born in the spirit. But secondly, we've got to act on it like it's already ours because it already is ours through Jesus. But thirdly, what helps us is to know what belongs to you as a believer. Right? What belongs to you? Again, I want to read to you Ephesians 1, 3, just to, re just to repeat it so it gets in your heart. Notice what it says. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, 
who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places. Where? In Christ. If you're in Christ, then you've already been blessed with every blessing. Well, it's in heaven and spirit, it's in heavenly places. But what does faith do? Faith receives into your reality what God has made available in the Spirit. You're not waiting on these things one day when you go to heaven. These are things that God has made available to you on earth, and his eyes are looking for the receiver to hit him when he has his hands out and he's ready, his faith hands to receive what God's made available. Praise God. God the Father has given his church and his people all we need to be powerful and to be blessed. What Jesus did for us from the moment he took on our sin and then was raised from the dead and seated at the right hand of God has provided us with everything we will ever need in our lifetime. Amen. Woo! Everything, what do you need? He already did it for you. God raised him from the dead and he's made you an heir and a joint heir. Everything you're ever going to need has already been provided for you. We are truly blessed people. I don't feel blessed, but you are. You need to get your stinking thinking renewed by the word of God and let faith rise up in your heart. You're blessed. Now, you may need to pray for some of that wisdom that James was talking about to walk in that blessing, but you're blessed. Why? Because every spiritual blessing has been made available to me, and I'm going to receive it right now by faith. Praise God. Our blessing is not some future event that we're waiting on. It's a reality now and a part of the abundant life that comes through Jesus. E.W. Kenyon, tremendous author and writer, Bible teacher from the past, he said this, what Jesus did in his substitutionary sacrifice is the private property, that's so awesome, of the individual for whom Jesus did it. I'm going to read that again because you all need to put your, you just need to stop and sila on that one for a moment. Get this. What Jesus did in his substitutionary sacrifice is the private property of the individual for whom Jesus did it. That means he did it for you. It's private property just for you. All you got to do is walk in it and receive it by faith. You know, the sinner, I'm closing with this, I promise. But the sinner doesn't have to beg God to be saved, does he? Does the sinner have God, please? Why? Because God has already made a way of salvation. Just like Noah had the door to the ark and God shut the door when Noah and his family got in, Jesus is the door that opened it back up. He's the way that opened the door of salvation. Sinners don't have to beg God for salvation. And guess what? If you've been born again and you're an heir and a joint heir with Jesus Christ, you don't have to beg him for a blessing. You don't have to beg him for a healing. You're not some... God, if you'll just drop me a few crumbs. Come on. That, that's, that's defeatism. That's religion of works. Come on. I'm going to stand in faith because everything that God would ever bless me with was done and accomplished in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. And God, today, I thank you. I'm blessed and I'm highly favored that my children walk in the blessing and the favor of God. I thank you, Lord, I walk in health in Jesus' name. I thank you everywhere I go, somebody is there waiting to bless me. Why? Because the blessing and the promotion of God is on my life. You're like, that sounds, that sounds like that crazy faith stuff. It is. Because you can't not live by faith in this natural world and not have people think you're crazy. But I want you to know today, I am not crazy. I'm not crazy. It's just faith in God. They thought Noah was crazy until it started to rain. I love all y'all, but how do you like me now? Right? Somebody sees your promotions. Like, I'm telling you, man, it's not just some faith stuff. It's just how you, it's how you live with God. You just live in faith. You're living by faith. Amen. We don't have to beg God for things. We just accept them by faith, and we know that we already have them because he's provided. So if God's word says you're healed, then I declare over you, search people today, you're healed. Accept it. <laughs> now, some people don't want to accept. Some people like sickness. I've met people like that, right? They like the sickness. It's like their pet. They, they just stroke and pet. It gives them attention, and they like being sick. Come on. 
No, not when God said, look, I'll take that pain and suffering and, and give you the healing. Amen? If God says you're blessed, he already said you're blessed. And search people, I declare of you in the name of Jesus, you're blessed today. Come on, stand on your feet right now and give God praise for it. He said you're healed, then you're healed. He said you're blessed, then you're blessed. He says he's given you grace and favor, then guess what? You walk out of here today and you go back to where you came from with grace and favor on your life. You walk into that job tomorrow like, man, I got to do this again today. No, I'm going to do it again today with the grace and the favor of God upon my life. If God says you're strong, then you're strong. I'm just feeling weak today. Come on. Let the weak say, I'm strong. Let the poor say, I'm rich. Why? Because of what the Lord has done for me. My circumstances don't tell me who I am. My situation doesn't tell me who I am. My family doesn't tell me who I am. My body doesn't tell me who I am. My em- My emotions don't tell me who I am. God has already told me who I am. He said you're more than a conqueror in Christ. He said I've given you the victory through your Lord Jesus Christ. He said by my stripes you are healed. He said cast your care on me for I care for you. You are what God says you are. There's nothing you can do to make it happen. There's nothing you can do to, you can't work it. You can't, you can't, there's nothing you can, in a, there's something in man to work. God's put work in us, and we think we have to work up to get it. All the, Abraham tried to work and produce an heir, and he produced an Ishmael. He had to get to the place where he's like, you know what? Forget it. I give up. Lord, I just stand and I receive. The Bible said he stood in the presence of the God whom he believed. The God who quickens the dead and makes alive. The God who calls those things that are not to be, though, as they are. And he put it, and he believed in what had been spoken, the Bible said. He said, and he became the father of many nations. You just, there's, you got to get to a place where you just say, you know what, Lord? You already accomplished the work. I believe it. I receive it in Jesus' name. Come on, right now, lift up your hands and just, whatever it is you need. Don't sit, stand there and beg him. God, please, 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 please. Come on, that's not it. You're, you're his son. You're his daughter. He loves you with an everlasting love. He loves you with an everlasting love, and he's made every, everything that is his is yours. Come on. Everything that is his is yours. He's made, you're a joint heir with Jesus. I'm not making this stuff up. It's what your Bible says, that you're heirs and joint heirs with Jesus Christ. Everything you would ever need in this life to do all the things God's called you to do has been made available to you by the Lord Jesus Christ in his death, burial, and his resurrection. So just receive it. Receive it. That healing right now today, receive it in Jesus' name. Come on, if you need hand, if you need, if you need prayer by laying on hands, I want you to come right now. We're going to pray for you, and you're going to receive a healing. You miss sickness. You need a miracle. You need a breakthrough. Whatever it is today, I want you to come to the altar right now. Don't miss your moment. And we're going to pray and believe and we're going to touch and agree. And you're going to receive what God has for you if that's you today. Come on. Amen. Don't come to church and have a need and not come and let us pray with you and agree. And receive it. Just receive it. Amen. Praise God. I know we're living in a time where people are worried about jobs and careers and situations and finances. But God, today, we're not beggars. We're the seed of Abraham by our faith and the blessing of Abraham. Jesus, you've, made, you've extended it to the Gentiles. And God, today that blessing and favor is on my life. We speak jobs and better jobs and positions and bonuses and raises and increases. Come on. We receive it because we're your children. God, I just pray. During our 21 days of fasting, one of our prayer points was extraordinary. This just hit me. and That's why I put it on the list. It's like, you know what? I got favor. <laughs> Like you just got barely enough favor to make it. But you know what? You've been extravagantly blessed by God. I got extraordinary favor of God on my life. I mean, I just sweat favor. Come on, somebody. (laughs) Everywhere I go, favor. Things just happen. Why does everything work out for him? It could work out for you too, but you got to know that you got favor and you got to use it. What good is it if you don't use it? I got favor on me. I speak over my children right now from the head to their feet. Favor and promotion just rests on them, Lord God. 
Lord God, in the midst of sickness, disease, and pandemic, we just pray healing and health and strength. We receive it. And we walk in it. And we walk in it. In Jesus' name. With your head bowed and your eyes closed, no one looking around. If you're here today and you've never prayed to receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior, man, today's got to be your day. If you're watching online right now and you've never prayed to receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior, please, we beseech you, we beg you, we urge you to make the greatest decision you'll ever make so that all those blessings we've been talking about can then be extended to you. You don't have to beg Jesus for salvation. He's, he's standing here today with open arms. You just got to submit your life to his lordship so that he can then be your savior. He's got to be your Lord first. And then he can be your savior. If that's you, you're tired of fighting in this life and not getting hit. You're like Peter. You fished all night. You're tired, of, but you're not catching anything. You need Jesus in your life. Just receiving my faith today with this simple prayer. Pray it in faith with me. Just say, Heavenly Father, I believe that you sent your son Jesus, that he was born of a virgin, that he lived a sinless life, and that he did die as a substitute for my sins. That he was buried, and on the third day, you raised him from the dead. Jesus, thank you for dying for me. I ask you to come into my heart and save me and make me new. And I pledge to live for you all the days of my life according to your word. I ask you to use me for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. If you prayed that prayer for the first time today, would you slip up that hand and let us recognize you in service? If you've prayed that prayer for the first time and you're watching online, please log on to our I Made a Decision page at surgechurch.tv. You can also find it on our Surge Church app. And we want to connect with you and help you in your spiritual growth and development. Hasn't it been good to be in the house of the Lord today? I don't know who you think you are. I don't know who you think you are. But I'm going to tell you who you are. You're a man and a woman of great faith. The Lord says you just get your hands up. That pass is coming. That blessing is coming your way. And I, we receive it today by faith in Jesus' name. Amen. We pray you were blessed by the worship and ministry of our surge experience today. It is our desire to see people experience a surge of God's power and grace that will empower them to live life beyond their limits. Thank you for tuning in and thank you for sharing the ministry of Surge Church with your friends and family and on social media. We love you and cannot wait to see you soon.